Good morning, good morning, good morning. Oh dear me, what's, what's happening with my hair? It's the right colour but the wrong shape. I'm going to have to go left because I'm late. And left is marginally quicker. How are you anyway, all right? It's a grey day, you know what that means. Good for the light. So, LBC rang me up the other day and said they wanted to uh, talk to me about the fact that a thousand dentists have left the NHS. So, it was at uh, 7.45 they wanted to talk to me. So I said, that's okay. And then <clears throat> about 7.30, 7.15, I got a, a text saying, sir, you know, Derek, don't, you know, we don't need you because of the uh, Biden uh, Putin potential summit over the uh, Russian uh, aggression in the Donbass, eastern Ukraine. Uh, we're not doing the dental story about a thousand dentists leaving the NHS and oh my god, think of the poor children, you know. So I mean, that's not at all unusual. I mean, it's quite normal for LBC to ring me up and say they want me and then ring me back and say they don't want me. You just get used to that in radio. They're just so uh, fluid in terms of their scheduling. Um, in fact, they could teach dentists a, a few things in terms of uh, finishing on time and scheduling, flexible scheduling. Anyway, that's not the point. The point was, <clears throat> And I'm not complaining that they cancel me. Although, well, I'll tell you what I do complain when they ring me up and say they want me and then I'm waiting on the end of the phone and they just don't ring and nobody has bothered to tell me that they don't want me. And so I waste like 20 minutes, uh, uh, you know, and all the time beforehand, marshalling my thoughts, making notes and stuff like that. So anyway, I thought I'd uh, just get a, have a quick summary really for you on uh, what, I think that the, what I think about this story about this thousand dentists leaving the NHS, by which I presume they mean that there are a thousand fewer contracts, NHS contracts. I don't think it's a thousand fewer people on the register, although it might be, but this is the extent of the preparation I've done on it, you see. But uh, I think really what they're talking about is why on earth is there a general flow, an outflow of dentists on the NHS? And to understand it, you have to understand a certain number of big principles, because it's, it's a big number, a thousand. I mean, one dentist leaving or joining the NHS is neither here nor there. But when they start leaving a thousand, and, and this is not this year's figures, it's last year's, God knows what it will be this year. So why are dentists leaving the NHS? Well, uh, the... I think you have to start at the top, so you have to look at the governance. Uh, the profession, if you like, is governed ultimately by the Health Select Committee, which is a group of uh, MPs that have indicated they've got a special interest in health. <coughs> so they, they put themselves forward to get elected to the Health Select Committee. So Now, they don't have to have um, an interest in health or want to do anything at all uh, meritocratic in terms of health all they need to do is realise that if you're on the health select committee you won't have to worry about hospitals being closed in your constituency so it's a very uh, that's why if you've got a, a big defence manufacturing factory in your constituency you want to be on the defence committee um, and uh, if you are, you know, you've got a big uh, exporter in your constituency, you want to be on the Foreign Trade Committee. And this is because, and I'll do it with reference to the Health Select Committee, because I've, I've given evidence to them twice and seen how they work. Department of Health works very hard to make sure that the MPs on the Health Select Committee are happy. Now, so far so good, you say. However, <clears throat> the way they do that is by putting them in a bubble where in their, in their um, 
uh, in their constituencies, everything goes right. Uh, and in every other, where, whereas perhaps in every other constituency things are going wrong, you can bet your bottom dollar that the Department of Health makes sure that the members of the Health Select Committee are happy with the health service. So when they get together and meet and take evidence, you can bet your life they're sitting there, fat, dumb and happy, uh, thinking that without a care in the world, wondering what everyone else is complaining about. So that's the first problem. We have a governance problem. And the Health Select Committee takes witnesses, the witnesses tell them how it is, Department of Health say no, that's not how it is. Uh, the Health the Select Committee makes a few recommendations and says that the Department of Health is going to get its ass kicked if it doesn't implement these recommendations. Uh, the uh, Department of Health doesn't implement the recommendations, coming up with all sorts of reasons why it can't be done or it can't be done this year. And um, then next time they meet again, nobody's any further forward. And thanks to the second problem, we're, we're further backwards. Now, what's the second problem? The second problem is that as a society, and it doesn't just apply to dentistry, we're moving towards a more collectivist approach, which means that if anyone's got a problem, they don't think that they need to fix it themselves. They think that somebody should be sent around to fix it. And so when it's a... It's a it's a well-kept secret that in the 80s and the 90s, uh, well, let's say the 70s and the 80s, and prior, when dentists were uh, self-employed subcontractors, uh, we were all in the private sector, but we were all thought to be NHS dentists because you could get NHS anywhere. So, and any dentist that provided NHS dentistry was an NHS dentist as far as the public was concerned, although we are, were all private. Then what happened was, when the market turned against the government and they felt that they could, uh, they could start to um, save money on the dental budget by micromanaging everything, which is a recipe for disaster because everything the government touches turns out to be slower, more expensive and more efficient than it would be in the public or the private sector. So after 1990-1992, that big debacle about um, last, the last throes of the free market where uh, dentists said, you know, our expenses are going up and uh, we're not getting reimbursed for them correctly. Um, the, we, we swapped over <laughs> the system where uh, the system was micromanaged from Richmond House under um, under the Chief Dental Officer because by then the government had more or less given up. They'd had a series of um, Secretary of States for Health who knew nothing about dentistry. So, so in the end, the Chief Dental Officer got the job of managing it by default, even though he's not, uh, you know. And you can imagine what an undemocratically accountable Chief Dental Officer, given full uh, powers that you know are held by democratic consent <clears throat> it's like a, an autocrat you have an autocratic type of leadership and um, so you had a situation where the majority of the profession was by then uh, nationalized because we were we prior to that we were able to say who we wanted to see and uh, where we wanted to practice and the sort of dentistry we wanted to do and then all of a sudden we're, we're being told that we need to perform a number and we can't uh, work where we like and we can't see what patients we like and we can't do what treatment we like. So it was a sort of a quasi-nationalisation. It was a nationalisation insofar as we uh, they, they nationalised all the uh, income but uh, didn't bother to nationalise the risk, you know, the, the financial risk. So, so micromanagement of the of the uh, of the service was the second problem, and and with that brought a ton of other problems like uh, failure to uh, uh, you know to, uh, sort of a deconstruction of the dental reference officer, the regional dental officer system, 
uh, closure of the dental practice board, dental estimates board that used to have all the centralised data uh, and uh, could see where the uh, outliers were, you know, the people who were abusing the system. Um, this uh, futile attempt to bring dentists in from abroad, this uh, futile attempt to stop dentists retiring early, this futile attempt to uh, get women who'd retired or uh, you know, given up the profession because they were bringing up a family or because they were pregnant and hadn't returned to the workforce to try and bring them back in. Um, all of this uh, micromanagement just contributed towards uh, reducing the quality of the terms and service of the, of the profession. Now, with regard to terms of service, I mean, again, I can speak on this with authority because I used to give evidence to the Doctors and Dentists Review Body or the review body on doctors and dentists remuneration, as I used to call it, uh, which is its correct title. And uh, when I started, we were in the top decile of earnings, by which I mean 10% of the wage earners earn more than us and 90% earn less. Now, now, okay, Angry, you say that's a bit high, but in fact it's not, because for the following reason, uh, dentistry requires three skills. It requires um, academic skills, it requires business skills, and it requires fine motor skills. And, you know, off the top of your head, I think you'd be hard-pressed to name another job that requires all three of those. Um, you know, even a brain surgeon only requires the academic and the motor skills. They don't really have to be business people. Um, um, and other people... Uh, might only require one of those skills, or at the most two of those skills, but very difficult to know anyone who needs all three. So, as a result, you know, we were well rewarded, uh, or we were rewarded commensurate with the skills that we had, and the risk that we took, bearing in mind that we set our own surgeries up, and we funded our own capital, and, uh, and, uh, and in most cases, loan that capital out to the NHS at a pretty reasonably low rate. So, so you've got the situation where you've got a failure of um, governance, which leads to a, a micromanagement, and then <coughs> and a drift into the private sector, and then. The final nail in the coffin, which is the uh, COVID. Now, why was COVID significant? Why has COVID meant that so many dentists have left the NHS? The reason is this. When the uh, Department of Health was thinking about how to cope with the COVID, pandemic as far as dentistry goes they said to dentists you could have 100% uh, of your income in return for just prescribing antibiotics and then as time has gone by and the treasuries put them under more and more pressure and the waiting lists have grown and grown and grown they've then they then started ramping it up so I think it was 25% and then 45% and then 65 and now it's going to be 80 or something but they made the dentist pinky swear that they would not take advantage of this uh, arrangement whereby they get all the money and don't have to do all the work. And the way dentists could take advantage would be to say to patients, um, you know, you, you're, we don't have any NHS availability for what you want, but it could be done privately. And the Department of Health knew this, <coughs> excuse me, right from the outset, and so, and that's why they made the dentist pinky swear that they wouldn't take advantage of the situation to convert all their NHS patients into the private sector. Now, you've got a situation where um, dentists have had, for two years, they've had the ability to get, in effect, get paid twice. To get paid by the NHS for work that they weren't required to do. And then also to do that work in the private sector and get paid for it. Because there's no enforcement of, uh, there's no, you know, declaration of any work that's done in the private sector on an NHS patient. 
unless it's a mixed course, in which case you've got some NHS, some private, then you have to declare how much of each. But if it's a totally private course, you don't have to declare it. So, in general, with dentists, there are some who are naturally private dentists who aspire to be in the private sector and, and are good enough because they're capable of taking the time and using the um, quality materials and quality laboratory work and have the skills to do the top level job. Then you've got another bunch of dentists who feel that they there's a financial opportunity into, in, uh, in moving into the private sector or their bank manager tells them that you know they're gonna have to take their kids out of private school if they don't uh, make more money, so then they have to go into the private sector and all the you know people doing private conversions through third party capitation plans and stuff like that. And then lastly, you've got a very large uh, rump of dentists who have uh, been in the NHS and made a lot of money. Bearing in mind, let's not forget that NHS dentists earn more than private dentists. So all the, all the, all the surveys always show that and it's very counterintuitive. Um, because it's very easy to abuse the um, NHS system thanks to the lack of uh, quality control and the more they ramp up the quality control the more dentists will leave and the Department of Health's job, main job and main problem is trying to convince dentists that they are not that they want to carry on working in the health service when they are you know they could charge three times traditionally I would say put it at about three times the NHS fee in, in the private sector so uh, in case you're wondering about the contradiction there and the, about uh, private dentists earning less but charging three times as much the answer is that um, <coughs> the extra time facilities training equipment laboratory costs and materials are more than make up for the extra fee so so Basically, as a private dentist, what you do is you end up with uh, working in a quality environment and having a lot of autonomy and your mental health being very good um, at the expense of um, a slight cut in your wages. And that, uh, most dentists think that that's worth the trade-off. Private dentists, or some, some private dentists do. But this, uh, this rump it doesn't. They don't think it's worth the trade-off. They'd rather just have the money. And this is... Uh, Again, it's a throwback to the Department of Health's efforts to try and get more people into the profession by uh, deregulating corporate bodies, um, and uh, you know, which is the equivalent of abolishing the Glass-Steagall Act, and uh, ended up commoditizing dentistry, um, and as a result, uh, we've had a bunch of um, dentists come into the profession who I always call the Ferengi who are basically not at all interested like I was in people's teeth or people um, but really in dentistry as a money-making profession you know as a profession where they'll, they'll have analyzed all the degree courses and they'll have looked at uh, you know if I get a degree in X how much will I earn if I get a degree in Y on qualification how much will I earn? And dentistry always comes up, you know, high, highly in those, in those, uh, because we are productivity driven and we earn a lot here. When we're young, a bit like footballers, when we're older, we don't want to work so hard. We slow down a bit, our earnings go down. And so we have like a, a backward earnings uh, curve in that we earn a lot when we're young unless when we're older and we're older we rely more on the fact that we've already paid our debts down perhaps paid our mortgage off got some investments etc so so there you go so we've got uh, a governance problem we've got a society which is increasingly collectivist which is reflected through the department of health <coughs> micromanagement of the profession and then lastly they gave dentists a two-year sandbox to experiment with going private 
which convinced a large majority of the, well, you know, a large number of the rump, the backwards rump, that um, it could be done, you know, because they they were allowed to do it, uh, and and the NHS paid for the experiment. So, all in all, easily explained, but not easily explained in one minute, which is what LBC tends to give me, and not easily explained when LBC cancels something which is of immediate interest to everybody in favour of a summit that never happened that really is of very little interest to most people in this country who will spend all their time looking for a dentist and not much time thinking about the Donbass. Right, nice to talk to you. I'll see you soon. Bye.